there lay two bodies in the shallow water, dead, and one of them was a king. King Ludwig II of Bavaria had many names, the Mad King, the Fairy Tale King, the Moon King, the Swan King. He loved nothing more than fairy tales, and the buildings he commissioned seemed truly as if they had come straight out of a storybook. How terrible, then, that his life should change into a tragedy, a murder mystery no one quite seems to be able to solve. There the two bodies lay in the shallow water, dead, and neither of them had drowned. Hello and welcome to Certainly Strange episode 27 and this episode marks the end of season 2 and before we get started I just wanted to thank you for sticking with me during this season and um, I hope that you have enjoyed the stories as much as I did telling them and this one, the last one of the season, is quite possibly my favourite story of this whole season. I always try to save the best for last, as I also did last season with the episode on the Watcher of 657 Boulevard. The topic of this episode is the strange death of Ludwig II, who during my research into this topic has become one of my favourite historical people, which is quite a list to be on considering how much I love history. So without any further ado, let's get into the story. Ludwig II of Bavaria of Haus Wittelsbach was born on the 24th of August, 1845. He grew up in Schloss Hogenschwangau, a medieval castle surrounded by thick green forests. It is no wonder then that young Ludwig soon became quite obsessed with fairy tales and old Germanic folklore. Though his parents were strict and cold, Ludwig was a romantic who did not lose his heart during his strict upbringing. He loved reading and playing dress-up, falling in love with nature, art and literature. He was also noted to be very generous, often giving his possessions away in forms of little gifts. He was also quite an introvert who liked to keep to himself, preferring to read a book over attending balls and other social events. He had very few friends, amongst which was his cousin, Sisi, who would later become the Empress of Austria, and Prince Paul of Thurn and Taxis, though it is said that this friendship was much more than just a friendship. Ludwig never married, though he was engaged to Duchess Sophie Charlotte of Bavaria, Sisi's favourite sister, the engagement was broken off, some say because Sophie had fallen in love with another man, yet others say that it is because Ludwig did not want to marry without love, something that he could not give Sophie because he was not attracted to women. Ludwig's father died when he was 18, forcing the young prince to ascend the Bavarian throne on the 10th of March 1864. Only two years later, the young king found himself entangled in a war, the Austro-Prussian War, having to choose sides between his uncle, king of Prussia, and his favourite cousin, Sisi, the Empress of Austria. Choosing to side with Austria, the war was lost. Prussia conquered Bavaria, upon which Ludwig II was no longer the sovereign of Bavaria, but instead a vassal. Ludwig II believed in the divine right to rule, a very romantic view where he saw himself as protector of his people, so when Bavaria became a vassal kingdom of Prussia, which then later became part of the Second German Empire, he regarded this as his greatest failure as king. Devastated and seeking to escape the harsh realities of his life, Ludwig II sought comfort in what he had loved so very much during his youth. Fairy tales. King Ludwig II became reclusive, never appearing at social affairs, balls and other state ceremonies. Instead, he worked on building his own fantasy world, constructing buildings that seemed to be right out of storybooks. In these projects, he preferred to work with theatre set designers instead of architects, which gave these buildings an extra layer of dramatic splendour. Each of his constructions, which he checked and approved every detail of himself, was a feat of engineering. Amongst the buildings he commissioned were Lindelhof Palace, 
Schloss Herrenschimsee, which is a small version of Versailles, and the most famous of all, Schloss Neuschwanstein, which was used by Walt Disney as inspiration for the world famous Cinderella's Castle. He adored the Sun King, Louis XIV, and liked to imagine himself as the romantic shadow of his namesake, calling himself the Moon King. I'm telling you, this man had a lot of nicknames. Though Ludwig completely neglected his social duties amongst the upper class, he loved riding his horse through the countryside to engage in conversations with his people and give them money. Though his architectural projects were throwing the state into a debt, he was a very popular king amongst the common people. Still, he did have some peculiar quirks. In 1875, he began to sleep during the day and wake up at night, and it is said that he despised ugliness, which created a hatred towards his own appearance. As the king turned 30, he stopped looking into mirrors because he hated to see that he was no longer the youthful, charming prince he believed he once was. His neglectfulness in his social duties as well as his spending habits were some of the reasons why the ministers of his cabinet were starting to come up with a plan how to get rid of him. When, in 1885, King Ludwig came to them asking for yet another loan, this was the final straw. They wanted to dethrone the Swan King and instead put his uncle, Prince Leopold, in power. To put this plan in motion, all that had to be done was to have Ludwig II be declared mad and therefore unfit to rule. Conveniently, Prince Leopold had a friend who was a doctor, one Dr. von Guden, who was willing to help with this plan. Without meeting and examining the prince personally, von Guden based his diagnosis on the written statements of three members of the king's stable and personal staff and two former cabinet secretaries that Prince Leopold had so conveniently found for him. There were statements of people who had spoken in the king's favour, amongst which was Otto von Bismarck, which the doctor chose to ignore. In 1886, Dr. von Guden came to the conclusion that Ludwig II was suffering from an advanced, incurable stage of paranoia that made it impossible to exercise his role as king for the rest of his life. Simply said, he was mad. The evidence that was cited for his madness included his increasing reclusiveness and reluctance to engage in public life, his homosexuality, his unusual powers of imagination and his excessive need for money. It must be noted that none of the traits that I have just described provides any reliable evidence that Ludwig was truly suffering from paranoia. Though he did suffer from social anxiety and experienced panic attacks, and it is said that he may have experienced depression and suicidal thoughts, similar to his cousin Cici, None suggests that he was overall unfit to rule. On the 9th of June 1886, Ludwig II was dethroned by the Bavarian Council of Ministers. The next in line of the throne was Ludwig's brother Otto, who was recently, and again very conveniently, been declared mad. And so Prince Leopold became regent of Bavaria instead. When they came to arrest him, Ludwig II protested that Dr. von Guden had never examined him. Regardless, Ludwig was taken away to Schloss Berg, which lay at the Lake Sternberg. In comparison to his childhood home and the wonderful fairy tale castles that he had built, this Schloss Berg was quite a depressing location for the Swan King to be locked away. In his palace prison, Ludwig was guarded by male nurses and was put under the care of Dr. von Guden. On June 13th, shortly after 6pm, Ludwig asked von Guden to join him for a walk along the lake. Von Guden agreed. A few hours later, around 10.30pm, their bodies were found floating in the shallow water of the lake. The death of the Swan King was declared to have been a murder-suicide that Ludwig II had drowned himself after having murdered the doctor, either out of revenge for having him falsely declared mad, or because the doctor had tried to stop him committing suicide in the lake. What is strange, however, is that in the autopsy neither of the men had water in their lungs. It is a very peculiar thing to drown without water in your lungs. 
it is certainly strange. Or perhaps there was something else at play here. Something that the House of Wittelsbach has been trying to hush up ever since. But before we get into that, first a word from one of my friends over at the Boopot Network. Hey listeners, my name is Kayla and I am the creator and host of a new podcast called Dark Tales from the Road. We cover true crime, spooky, creepy, and ghostly stories, and I want to take you state by state and country by country to bring you stories you may not have even heard of before, and also learn some history on the city and the state where it takes place. So join me on the road as we discover dark tales. New episodes are posted every Wednesday. I have an Instagram, Facebook, and a Patreon, all at Dark Tales from the Road. Thank you so much, and I hope everyone has a great day. That was the promo for Dark Tales from the Road. If you like my podcast, I am certain that you will love this one as well. Now, let's get into what some circumstantial evidence suggests might have actually happened at the lakeside that one fateful day. So, the cause of death was ruled for both men as drowning. Only, like I said, neither of them had water in their lungs. Von Gooden's body showed that he had sustained blows to the head and it seemed as if someone had attempted to strangle him. There were also scratches on his face and a broken fingernail on one of his hands. All of these signs point to the suggestion that he had been attacked and that he had fought his attacker. In the autopsy report of Ludwig, however, there were no signs of injury except for a scraped knee. Who then, you might wonder, did Dr. von Gunn fight? And is the autopsy report to be trusted? According to a lost note written by the physician who had examined the dead king, he claimed that the report that he had made was false. He stated that the Bavarian ministers had ordered him to leave something out of his report. What, you might ask? There were two bullet holes in the king's back. So, if the king was shot, who had pulled the trigger? A diary was found in 1933, confirmed by handwriting analysis to belong to one Jacob Liedel, Ludwig II's personal fisherman who had remained loyal to the king. In it was written how he was forced to remain silent about something that he had seen that evening. Three years after the king's death, I was made to swear an oath that I would never say certain things. Not to my wife, not on my deathbed, and not to any priest. The state had undertaken to look after my family if anything would happen to me, in either peacetime or war. In the diary, he described how he had been hiding behind some bushes in a boat, waiting for the king to help him escape his imprisonment. As the king stepped up to his boat and put one foot on it, a shot rang out from the bank, apparently killing him on the spot, for the king fell across the bow of the boat. The king was dead and in the water. But who then had murdered the doctor? This may have been revealed by a discovery by the art historian Professor Siegfried Richman. In 1967, he was presented with a sketch that presented three faces one of which appeared to be of a dead man. Richmond confirmed that the sketch had been made by a painter named Hermann Kalbach. The face on the left depicted an older gentleman with a look of shock and the man on the right seemed to cry. They are both looking at the man in the middle who was dead with blood dripping from his mouth. On the back of the paper these three men have been identified by name The man on the left was Maximilian Slicho von Lohenfeld, the king's personal physician. The man on the right was a man called Horich, another loyalist to the king. The man in the middle was Ludwig II. The fact that blood was present on his corpse seems to be evidence that he did not drown. In 1982, von Lohenfeld's estate went up for auction, which contained old books, letters and paintings. Professor Richman was able to buy the items and found in an old book a handwritten note describing exactly what had happened that day. 
Believing that the king was in danger, von Lohenfeld had set out with the painter Hermann Kalbach and the two brothers named Horich to see the king at Berg Castle. As they arrived, they sensed that something was wrong. They discovered the king, dead, having been shot in the back, with von Guden standing over his body. Apparently, he was trying to change the king's clothing while staunching the wound. Seeing the four men, he rushed at them, at which the brothers Horik fought him and eventually strangled him to death. Other evidence to suggest that Ludwig II truly was shot in the back is the account of a Munich banker called Detlef Utemol, who has told of his meeting with Countess Josephine von Brakaunitz, a distant relative of the royal family, when he was 10 years old. He tells that the Countess had shown him and other guests at her house the coat that the King had worn the day that he had died. She had opened the chest and pulled out a grey coat with two bullet holes in the back. The Countess died in a fire together with her husband in her home in 1937, a fire in which very conveniently the King's coat also perished. To this day, the von Wittelsbach family has refused all requests to an exhumation or a re-examination of Ludwig II's body. The Swan King himself had said, I wish to remain an eternal enigma to myself and to others. It seems that he got his wish. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Certainly Strange, and in fact this entire season. It has been an absolute blast. I hope to return this podcast somewhere this summer, possibly with some longer episodes, so that you can enjoy them whilst you are laying in the sun. Please consider leaving behind a review on Spotify and following us on Instagram at Certainly Strange the Podcast. Everything about the podcast can be found on the website certainlystrange.com. There you can also find the transcript of the episode as well as all the sources that I used in my research. And once again, Thank you for listening. Bye and see you next time.